Tea time for the Open Championship from Carnoustie Golf Links in Scotland is Thursday morning as defending champion Jordan Spieth is in search of his first win since Royal Birkdale. We'll preview the third major of the season with in-depth player analysis, course knowledge, the latest odds, trends, and picks as Prime Sports Golf on Prime Sports Network starts now. You're listening to Prime Sports Golf for this Tuesday, the 17th of July, 2018, with Jeff Shane, Brady Cannon, Joel Cook on the Prime Sports Radio Network. Prime Sports Golf is brought to you by ProGolfWeekly.com and Covers.com. Make sure to visit Covers Experts at experts.covers.com. Take 50% off any purchase. Use the promo code PRIME50. That's PRIME50. And that's right. It's the third major of the season. We've been waiting for this, uh, Jeff. It seems like because of how incredibly just weak the fields have been on the PGA Tour over the past several weeks, it seems like we've been waiting forever for the Open Championship. And thank <laughs> goodness it's here. Yeah, I would imagine that we we uh, probably got to about seven days after Shinnecock and uh, started looking at, at the field. It actually, it was a decent field for the travelers, but after that, we started thinking, okay, when, when is Carnoustie coming, and uh, can I watch a, another repeat of the documentary on Carnoustie 99, and uh, how do we fill this time between Shinnecock Hills and Carnoustie? Yeah, well, it's here, so uh, we're, we've, we've only got, I mean, really, because of the fact that it, that coverage starts at one thirty in the morning Eastern time tomorrow, and I know... You're pretty good at staying up late, so uh, you can actually turn on uh, Open Championship Golf before you go to bed, uh, especially if you're on the West Coast time like uh, Brady Cannon is. Brady, uh, you're going to be able to – you're going to be in bed. You're going to have the pillow up. You're going to have uh, your remote in your hand, and you're going to flip on the Golf Channel, and uh, before you start getting tired, you're going to be able to watch first-round coverage of the Open Championship if you like. Well, you're almost exactly right, Greg. It's actually my wife's favorite week of the year because uh, for about four days in a row, I sleep on the couch. Oh, the so, couch. Uh, That's yeah, even better. I started about midnight and uh, just try and, uh, you know, kind of half awake, watch the uh, open until about four or five in the morning and then uh, – get back in the office and go to work again. All right. Well, that's okay. I mean, nothing wrong with that. At least she gets it. And uh, you're okay with that, too. You get the opportunity to watch uh, golf. And uh, as long as your wife is okay with it, uh, who's who's going to complain? Okay. Yeah, there is something awful cool about, uh, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> with uh, everyone fast asleep and uh, watching live major championship golf. Yes, absolutely. That's, uh, that's, that's really part of the specialness of it here for us uh, Americans uh, and and uh, especially anybody on the West Coast. Of course, East Coast is a little bit more difficult, but, hey, that's what the DVR is for. Uh, we can get up in the morning and, uh, boy, we just zoom through those commercials and watch uh, nothing but golf for, uh, what do they got, like eight, nine hours of coverage or something like that on the Golf Channel for the first couple of days? Yeah, it's I want to a say tremendous 13. amount. Uh, pl plenty of golf for us to, to take in. Not like the Masters, that's for sure. 13, you're saying, Jeff? That's possible? I, 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 I want to say... That it, it's you know something like you know th uh, you know two a.m. to four p.m. or something like that. Well, I, they might be I, doing I, the um, you know the repeats. Maybe that's what you're saying because they, that's probably what they do is they'll repeat it from uh, nine thirty to four a.m. <clears throat> uh, no, it, it, here here's Thursday and Friday: one thirty a.m. first ball in the air, four p.m. finish. So we literally we are talking fourteen and a half consecutive hours. So are they going to do? Does that mean on Thursday and Friday they're going to go like first tea time? They're going to show first group. I, I I can't guarantee that it will be the first group, although it certainly sounds like it. But four p.m. equates to ten p.m. or nine p.m. I should say. Uh, out in uh, Scotland, so they are gonna they're gonna go through the final groups. Okay, uh, right before dark. That'll work. I ain't gonna complain. All right. <laughs> so uh, Brady, uh, what about Carnoustie and uh, not, of course, a typical PGA Tour uh, fee, uh, uh, course uh, that we are very familiar with. 
Uh, but there's been a lot of talk this week uh, about the fairways being really fast and how that's going to potentially benefit whether it's going to be uh, your normal golfer off the tee that uh, is not very consistent uh, and, and also the uh, potentially the golfers that don't have the power in their game because they're going to get that extra 50 or 100 yards uh, th- that uh, they don't normally get off the tees. But that could also be something that could, could end up as a positive for the power hitters. Maybe the power hitters will be able to uh, reach the green uh, sometimes or get close to the green on a par four. Who knows? I mean, it's crazy. So it, do you think it's going to favor any specific, a specific type of golfer? Well, it's really the question of the week. Uh, you know, we started seeing the coverage, uh, I guess it was yesterday, in the fairways, uh, because of the drought they've had in the area, the fairways are, are really dried out and, uh, you know, thin and hard. And, I mean, guys are hitting drives over 400 yards, you mentioned, with the rollout that they're getting. So I, I think it's a question for both us and the players. How are the players going to decide to attack the golf course? Are they going to lay up and try and stay short of the bunkers? Are they going to hit an iron off the tee and try and maintain accuracy and uh, avoid the bunkers that way? Or are they going to take the, the driver out and try and bomb it past all of the trouble and, and cross their fingers that they get a good lie? Um, the, the rough is not that penal because, again, of the drought that has uh, been taking place in the area over the course of this summer. Uh, so you don't have that thick, dense rough. So I, I really think in the long run it probably benefits the bombers because they can gamble uh, you know, and try and get past all those bunkers and probably not get into too much trouble with that rough not being what it was uh, from Carnoustie's past. Yeah, and that would be interesting because, really, if you, if you look at uh, the list of winning uh, Open Championship uh, just over uh, it's recently, of course, you're going to throw Rory in there, but we don't see a lot of Bombers winning the, the, uh, the, the Open Championship, Jeff. So maybe all of a sudden you get some of these longer hitters that can come into play now. That's quite possible. This might just all, all of a sudden... While everyone's thinking that this is going to benefit the shorter hitters, maybe it's actually going to benefit the longer hitters. It will definitely give longer hitters options. And and maybe they don't have to play with a driver. Remember that it was 12 years ago that Tiger Woods won at a baked-out Hoylake by hitting one driver in the first round and not – and not so again. What the the Bombers have is they have the ability to say, you know what, I don't need to – take the risk with the driver. I'm pretty accurate with a three iron, or I'm pretty accurate with a, with a three wood. And with the run out that we're going to get, maybe that's the way to make sure we hit these fairways. And uh, even though I agree with Brady that the rough isn't going to be Carnoustie rough that we remember from 07 or 99, they're still pretty narrow fairways. And you're better off playing from that grass even if, uh, you know, the, the, the rough is shorter than we're sure. used to at Carnegie. Yeah, C. it's going to be interesting. All right, so uh, let's get into it. Uh, what I want to do first is, uh, uh, Brady, I want to ask you uh, to I'm gonna get a couple of picks from you. First, I want to get your top pick. Who is going to be your top pick to win the Open Championship and why? Well, I think my top guy right now, considering the odds and, and also – how he comes into the tournament and and what game he brings uh, to the event and the conditions that are being presented is John Rahm. Uh, I think John Rahm has a ton of power and he can bomb it, you know, all over this yard uh, if he wants to go that direction. Uh, He's fairly accurate off the tee, hits a lot of greens in regulation. Uh, He's efficient from tee to green, so he he can play it that way if he prefers. And I really like his short game. I, I think uh, you know, we talk about all this strategy off the tee. No matter what these guys choose to do, uh, they're going to be in a position from 50 to 100 yards away from the hole where they're really going to be under the microscope to perform. I, I really think it's going to come down to the short game. Uh, again, however they choose to, to handle these fairways, sure. uh, once they get down close to the green, I think that's where the champion is going to be decided. Uh, Rom not only is good in that area, but he comes in the last couple of weeks uh, defending his title at the Irish Open with a fourth-place finish, and the week prior to that, finishing fifth at the Open de France. So, 
I, I like the way he's coming in. He's been spending a lot of time on the European tour. Uh, he's proven that he can play link style golf, and at uh, twenty, anywhere from about twenty to twenty-five to one, I think that's a pretty decent number. Yeah, five top fives in his last seven worldwide with the win in Spain. All right, so give me. I actually also to give me a long shot. Uh, not your typical long shot because we've seen crazy long shots in the Open Championship contend before. So I wanted you to give me a 100 to 1 or higher long shot to contend well, or possibly about, win. Well, how about 150 to 1 hmm. on Kiradek Affy Barnrat? Okay. Uh, you can find him. I've seen as high as 150 to one. Uh, there might be some stores that have him a little lower, maybe a little higher, but uh, certainly in that neighborhood. Um, he's another player that uh, plays a lot uh, on the European tour, so he's got the experience over there with Lynx Golf. He's very accurate off the tee, and he's excellent around the greens. and And I think that's going to be a winning combination. I, I don't know if it's going to be. The barn rat, but uh, I, I like those statistical areas of you know being efficient and accurate off the tee, and then being really good around the greens. I think that uh, is what uh, you know the winner, the winner's pedigree is going to to have on it this week. So uh, the barn rat, you know, um, at 150 to one, I, I think that's a really good value. I, I think his odds should be lower than that. So. Um, I'm looking at that one as far as a long shot. All right. He's got three wins since December, and uh, right now he sits at 30th uh, in the world. Not bad for 150 to one shot. All and right. just finished 15th at uh, Shinnecock, too. All right. Let's go ahead, and now uh, we're going to go over the, some matchups here that are not necessarily the big ones, uh, but matchups that I thought were pretty intriguing. I got five matchups, and I asked you guys to uh, to uh, pick them based on the odds as well, and also uh, make sure you only take at least two favorites out of these five. So let's uh, run run through these quickly. Uh, let's start first of all with Luke List, Emiliano Grio, and Danny Willett. Willett's been playing better of late. List had a really good week last week, and Grio uh, is actually a hundred to one, which that was uh, that's showing some respect for him coming in this week. Uh, so uh, they're pretty much all even uh, with List at one sixty five plus one sixty five, Grio and Willett at plus one eighty. So uh, which way would you go with this group, Brady? So the, these are three balls. They're paired together, and you're just asking who's going to finish the lowest uh, in correct. day one. Correct. correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I like Willett at plus 180. You mentioned he's been playing a lot better as of late, and he really has. And, you know, I think he probably has more experience on this golf course and in Lynx golf than these other two guys do. Um, Luke List, of course, had a great week, as you mentioned, oh. uh, at the Scottish Open. But I don't know how – likely that is to carry over here uh, at Carnoustie. Uh, so, you know, I, I think Willett is kind of a live dog right now. People have been down on him, and, and rightly so, ever since he won the Masters. He's really been awful. But uh, we've seen uh, a nice positive surge uh, out of his game the last few yes. weeks, and I would go that direction. Yeah, three top 20s in his last five, including two top 10s. Jeff, which way would you go in that list? I would tend to agree with Will. That all of a sudden, we've seen signs of life from him as we have moved to the two events that are Lynx prep golf courses, the Irish Open and, and the Scottish Open. He had done nothing with the exception of a top 10 at the Italian Open. And I mean literally nothing, you know, going back into February. Uh, and all of a sudden, he's got two top 20s in his last two starts. So I, I think Lynx Golf probably agrees with him and certainly uh, a little bit more with, than we'll, we would see with Lister Grio. All right, out of the five uh, groups, that's the most even group. But let's go to the next one, Brady. And we got Retief Goosen is the favorite in the group at plus 135. Uh, Longer is at plus 150. And Darren Clark is at plus 260. Don't laugh, but it, uh, because this is uh, the Open Championship. You never know if a Darren Clark's going to have a better day on Thursday than Goosen and Longer. Uh, so is it worth it, or uh, do you feel more confident with the better longer on the senior tour or Retief Goosen? This one was really tough for me, and, and I know you were only giving me the opportunity to choose one favorite, and, I, and I'm saving that one. So I, I'm going to go with Bernhard Longer here. Uh, you know, I like the fact that he has a low ball flight, and he's such a plotter. 
Uh, and Goosen is too. Goosen's a real grinder as well. But I, I just I think like the trajectory of Longer's golf ball uh, more so than the other two guys. I know, of course, Clark has won the championship before, uh, and Goosen a two-time U.S. Open winner. But um, I, I think Bernhard might be in the best form of all these guys right now. Jeff. It, it's kind of really been an off year for Bernard Longer. I, I'm going to take Retief Goosen in this case. We, we've, we've seen him kind of alternate missed cuts with pretty good finishes, and he's the guy in this group that actually went through qualifying to get into this field. Uh, he, he made top three at Prince's, and so he did it by playing Lynx golf. And so I'm going to take Goosen in this case. All right, next group, Brady. We got Ustays and Reed and Casey. So two major champs. Casey, though, is still late waiting for his first major. Reed is the favorite of the group at plus one fifty. Casey plus one sixty five, and Ustays in at two ten. Well, what concerns me here is Ustays uh pulling out of the Scottish Open last week because uh, of an injured neck, and I and I just don't know the status on that. Uh, Stenson, you know, a similar story there with a sore elbow. Uh, I don't know what kind of shape these guys are in coming in uh, this week, uh, but if I had to do it right now, uh, which you're asking me to, <laughs> I would uh, take Louis Eustizen at okay. plus 210. Uh, this guy's won a British Open before. Casey has not had great success in this championship, nor has Reed. Reed uh, really becoming a major specialist, it looks, uh, as of late, uh, with three straight top tens and, of course, a win at the Masters. Um, but I would look at Louie in this three ball. Yeah, I mean, considering getting plus 210 as well, I think that does, it's also, if you're going to go with a long shot at a, you know, in these groups, who stays is not bad at uh, two to one. Jeff, which way would you go? I think in in this case, I, I will go with a favorite. I will take Reed. I, I think that he, as as you said, Brady, he's kind of built for majors right now. Uh, he's kind of learned how to ad- how to adapt his game a little bit better. Reed actually plays a little bit on the European tour uh, as well. He holds membership uh, over there, and so uh, I, I just think that uh, in in a situation where, especially if these agree, uh, fairways get maybe really fast and really fiery. Uh, he's got that kind of bulldog mentality that I always like to see in a major, and I, I tend to gravitate toward guys like Reed in that case. All right. Uh, two more to go. Uh, Brady, we've got Rory at plus 115, so he's even, uh, but you got a couple of interesting sleepers here. Mark Leishman at plus 185 and uh, Thor Golison at plus 260. Which way would you go? Uh, I would take Olison here. Um, Rory... You know, the, the the conditions are going to be somewhat calm this week, but there's going to be certainly a couple days where the wind is going to blow. And uh, Rory is actually not the best wind player in the world. And I think when things get really tough, uh, that that's when it gets tough on Rory. We, we saw him, of course, win the Open at Hoy Lake, and I think he was 17 under par or something like that, you know, really – uh, a birdie fest as far as a major championship's concerned. And, and, you know, he did the same thing at Congressional for the U.S. Open. So I think Rory really flourishes when the conditions are a bit easier. And uh, Olison, we've uh, seen have tremendous success, uh, won the Italian Open back in June, and he's also won the Alfred Dunhill Lynx Championship, which incorporates Carnoustie in, in a three-course uh, three rotation there. Uh, so I like the number at plus 260. Why can't this guy uh, yeah. beat these guys in the first round? Absolutely. Uh, Olison is a live dog. He's uh, playing some really good golf. Still very inconsistent, but uh, if he has a good day, uh, that's all you're looking for. And then, uh, Jeff, who would you go with? Uh, I'm uh, I'm also kind of going with the win player, and you know how much I like Mark Leishman in the wind, especially you know on a on a flat, open, barren space of land. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that he's come close. I I, I like Olison, but I just I, I think Leishman is kind of uh, a player whose ball flight and and uh, approach to to the game really fits. Uh, an open championship really in any venue. Yeah, Leishman, by the way, uh, has uh, finished sixth or better in three of his last four uh, open championships. All right, and then final group, we have Tiger at plus 125, Brady, and then we've got Matsuyama and Knox, who's who's hot even though he cooled off a little bit uh, in Scotland last weekend. Uh, both Matsuyama and Knox are two to one. So which way would you go here? 
Well, I saved my favorite for the last, and I'm going to go with Tiger Woods, believe it or not. I know many times on this show, Greg, we've talked about how you know, he, his price is off, and, and he, he garners so much action and attention that uh, we really don't see his true odds too often. But uh, I actually like him in this three ball, and it's really because of what this golf course presents this week. We saw him in 2006, as Jeff talked about earlier, uh, only hit one driver at Hoy Lake when it, too, had very dry, baked-out fairways that had all kinds of run out. Uh, he was able to avoid the bunkers that week and, and go on to win the Claret Jug. Uh, I, I don't know if he's going to win this week, but I think the formula is going to be similar for Tiger. And his short game is excellent. That hasn't been his problem. His problem is really with the driver. And if he doesn't have to hit driver this week, hmm. that's going to benefit him quite a bit. So I, I would go with Woods in this three ball. All right. And, and uh, Jeff, who would you go with? Uh, I'm I'm going to take uh, Russell Knox. He's the guy that has been playing Lynx golf here these last couple of weeks. He is native to Scotland, um, and I, I just think he comes in with form. And while we all you know love love to point to that Hoy Lake example as what Tiger can do on a baked out uh, golf course, this isn't 2006 anymore. I, I just <laughs> I need to see more. Simple as that. All right, Brady. So uh, I appreciate it once again. Uh, and uh, before I let you go, though, uh, it, it, this is a slow time of year for your your other business, being the regional manager of TeaTimesUSA.com? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the phone's not ringing a whole lot. It's 110 degrees out here. And, uh, <laughs> you know, people are waiting Perfectly. until uh, September, October to come to Las Vegas to play golf again. So, you know, that's a good thing, though. I Like you know, uh, recently I took a little break, and uh, now I get to uh, watch the British Open uh, <laughs> without having to do a whole lot more. That helps. Brady, I appreciate it. Uh, enjoy the late-night golf, and we'll talk to you again next week. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, that's Brady Cannon. And, again, over with Covers at Covers Experts. So use that promo code PRIME50. Get 50% off any purchase, experts.covers.com. And uh, taking a look uh, a little bit further at what we're dealing with as far as trends, Jeff, only one playoff in the Open Championship the last eight years, but they've had two straight playoffs at Cornusti. Uh, actually, they've had three. Three? <laughs> you really? Have to go, you ha yeah, you have to go back. back. Before 99, there was a 24-year gap. All the way back to 1975. Oh, I remember but that one. Tom Watson <laughs> defeated Jack Newton in the last 18-hole playoff that they had oh. at the Open Championship, and and that was a situation actually just like uh, uh, just like 99 in 2007, where the 18th hole at Carnoustie tripped up the leader and dropped him into a playoff, and uh, Watson actually birdied 18 in, in, uh, on the final hole of regulation to get in and then uh, beat him 71-72 uh, uh, on the uh, fifth round, so to speak. All right. Uh, let's uh, welcome in Joel Cook from ProGolfWeekly.com. Uh, Joel, I'm going to ask you what uh, I asked the, these guys to talk about in the open to the show and that if, if they can name specific players, uh, the type of player. Uh, that actually could benefit the most on this course. But I want to ask you to name some specific players that you think could actually benefit uh, from the golf course this week. Well, from the fast greens, um, and not fast greens, fast fairways, uh, trajectory is going to kind of play into that. So some of these guys with the low ball flights, um, you could really get out there like an Ian Poulter or Brandon Grace. Uh, Ryan Moore can do that pretty good with controlling the distance. Mm -hmm. well, he's not really a long hitter. But um, and those are guys I think are going to have a little bit of advantage here. And you know, also, you know, someone like Dustin Johnson who can take those uh, pop bunkers out of play. Uh, I heard Brady mention Rom. He's another one. Um, there, there's a few players that could really take advantage of this. Uh, it, it definitely does seem like something uh, that would really favor the favorite right now, Dustin Johnson. Now, what do you think about uh, – now, there's always crazy weather, Jeff, at, at this event. So what are we expecting for four days? Are we expecting it to be the same kind of conditions? Uh, any chance that we can get some crazy weather at, at any point? Uh, you, you can't count anything out because it's Scotland, but the forecast 
do not call for any sort of change in, in, in the heat wave that, that they have experienced for two months. I, I think what we may see, uh, and I forget whether it's Friday, Saturday, or Saturday, Sunday, but we may see an increase in the wind. And uh, that could very well be very interesting because when you're com- combining fast fairways with wind, uh, then all, then they only get baked out even more, and they run even farther, and you could run off that fairway. But uh, I, I don't think we're we're going to see any sort of uh, you know uh, rain incident uh, of any of any sort as we uh, go through the week. All right. Uh, let's uh, go into our picks and go over the uh, odds and all that stuff. So, uh, Jeff, you have the first pick, and uh, then I go, and then Joel goes. So, uh, by the way, Joel, uh, good good almost get on the long shot last week with Eddie Pepperell. Yes, I was excited when I saw him uh, suddenly get in the mix. Just, it figures that Brandon Stone would have that career day, not even just kind of a career day, like the best he's ever probably going to shoot ever <laughs> yeah. um, at, at that last <laughs> round. But, I mean, he earned it. Take it away good, from your 100-to-1 shot. Yeah, it was good to see Pepper, Pepperell uh, make me look smart there. But, yeah, I, was, I would prefer to Stone had done that a different week. All right. Well, maybe this week. Okay, Maybe. now uh, let's uh, go ahead and uh, go through the picks. So, Jeff, who is going to be your first pick, Open Championship? And, by the way, when we're done with our picks, uh, we have our top three. Then we have our long shot. That's any golfer that's 50-1 to one or higher as far as the odds. Then we have our two alternates in case any of the golfers uh, do not tee it up for whatever reason, you know, like a Dustin Johnson kind of maneuver uh, from the Masters, and uh, they can't play on Thursday. Uh, then we use the alternates. And uh, after we're done with the picks, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Joel and Jeff to give me their top three picks overall, just period, whether or not uh, they were in uh, this little contest we have every week. But, Jeff, your first pick, you don't have to worry about anybody taking yours. So who are you going to go <laughs> ahead and go with? I, I tell you, it's, it's wide open. It, is, it, it has not been an easy decision at all, and, and I think the – I maybe I get caught up in, in in you know the red flags or maybe yellow flags in this case because uh, uh, just you know everybody's got a positive and a negative. But I'm going to go with the guy uh, that has maybe played the most consistent all season, uh, even going back into late last year, and he has experience at Carnoustie. He was 12th in 2007, and, and well, a lot of these other favorites, this is going to be their first encounter with Carnoustie. So I'm going to take Justin Rose as my top pick at 16-1. to 1. All right, Justin Rose, uh, who uh, was one of my top two picks as well. Uh, you know, he doesn't have the great resume, which is two top tens and 16 appearances at the Open Championship, uh, which would normally surprise people. But he did have that 12th in 2007, which was one of his better finishes uh, at the Open Championship. And uh, let's also just keep in mind, and I think this is important when you're talking about players this week, a couple of different factors that I'm looking at. Uh, but one, let's remember that at the Masters, Patrick Reed didn't have any success at the Masters, and he went out and won. Right. Sergio really had choked his way at the Masters last year, and he won. Now, this ain't the Masters, but it just shows you that, and, and with Brooks Kepka winning the U.S. Open, I mean, what were the odds truly on Brooks Kepka winning back-to-back U.S. Open? It just doesn't really happen. So those types of odds and situations I think you can throw out, especially at this golf course for players that like Justin Rose that are mentally tough, uh, you, and that have been here before, you would think that they would have an advantage, Joel, uh, and that's kind of what I'm looking at, really. I, I think there's so many different ways you can go, as Jeff was alluding to. But I think what you have to think about it, when you just throw away all the stats and the past history and everything, because nobody's really, you know, they've only been on this golf course, maybe if, if they're lucky once or twice, you know, professionally, is, you know, based on how tough this golf course is, is how mentally tough is the player you're going to pick. And that's going to be important. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, there are players in the field who have experience in this kind of course, but on this specific course, really the only players in the field who aren't shells of their former selves who have good history here. I mean, you've got Sergio Garcia, who uh, almost went wire to wire once, and then Rory McIlroy, um, 
he, uh, I mean, he finished tied for 43rd, but as an 18-year-old amateur, and he got on the, he was uh, third after the first round. So I would say that was a good week for him too. But other than that, there's not really a whole lot of. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, Patrick Harrington was good, but you know, you're not taking him. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, and this is definitely going to be a course where you're going to have a lot of uh, mental strength is going to is going to be huge. We saw that down the stretch with Jordan Spieth last year, Henrik Stenson the year before that. Um, it's really going to yeah, definitely uh, want someone who, who's got this mentally. All right. Uh, I'm going to go uh, again. I, I had I had two picks that I was going to go with. Uh, Jeff took one of them. So I'm going once back again with Ricky Fowler. Why not? He played well last week. Uh, he's 16 to one, just like Justin Rose. And he's been so close before. He's got the three major runner ups, uh, including the Open Championship in 2014. So he knows how to play Lynx golf. He's won the Scottish Open before. Uh, It would not be a surprise at all that if Ricky Fowler won his first major, uh, he was able to do it uh, at the Open Championship. And another thing that I've noticed uh, over the past uh, month or so in in Ricky's game, which is very important, is uh, he seems to have his putting back to as close to as normal as we're used to it. Uh, and he was that, that really bad run that he was going through a few months ago, which you just, I mean, we just stayed away from him for a couple of months, but his putting was completely off. His putting is back pretty much to normal now, and uh, he seems to be dialed in. So uh, hopefully the, the experts will stay away from picking him this week too much because we know what that does, especially to a player like Ricky. And uh, do you, Joel, recall anybody? I mean, I haven't noticed it much. I mean, I'm watching a lot of you know pre-tournament stuff, but I haven't really noticed much. Maybe we'll see it with 14 hours of coverage on Thursday and, and Friday. Maybe we'll start hearing it. But I haven't really noticed uh, anybody on the uh, when is Ricky going to win the big one uh, deal. You know, so I haven't heard that yet this year. Maybe it's coming. You know, maybe 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 in the next four days, or, or who knows? Maybe in the PJ Championship if he doesn't win the Open Championship. Yeah, now that you mentioned that, I, I haven't. I didn't really think of, think of that before, but I haven't really heard much of that either. I mean, I, I see people um, in the media, you know, um, guessing that this will be his time, but I, I haven't heard a lot of when's he going to win? Is he ever going to win? Um, what does this do in, to where his standing is with the elites if he continues to not uh, win these? Yeah, and I'm surprised about it too, Jeff, because he hasn't won this year. I mean, he won it in December, right? Or the hero is that December or November, but he hasn't won since. Well, and, and the hero is, on, is an 18 man field. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that, that's one of those that you kind of put an asterisk next to. And, you know, maybe maybe that's part of it too. There there is there. I'm sure there is in a lot of people just this deep seated idea that uh, not only is it his time, he's overdue, or at least he's due to win this year. And thinking all the stars are going to align, possibly. Well, let's see if we hear it this week. Who would you go with, Joel, <laughs> Ricky Fowler, or Justin Rose? Between those two, um, I like Fowler just a touch better. Um, actually, I have them ranked uh, closely together. Actually, in my rankings on Pro Golf Weekly, um, I've got Fowler third and uh, Justin Rose sixth. Um, sixth? Okay. Is that because well, his past history? I would probably bounce him up a touch. Uh, one of those guys I have ahead of him is Henrik Stenson, and there's some concern about his shoulder. Uh, I thought the shoulder was nothing, but now I'm hear- hearing uh, maybe there is something to that. But uh, sixth isn't really – it sounds like kind of an insult, but he uh, – it's, there's just a really, really good feel at the top, and you can put these guys in any position. But, I mean, yeah, he, Rose has just been so good everywhere. But, um, yeah, I don't know, just with past history and uh, the way Ricky looks really determined uh, to finally end that end that whole major thing. I mean, he had the worst round of worst rounds on that Saturday, the U.S. Open. But other than that, he looks very comfortable on the, big, on the big stages this year, even if he hasn't won. All right, Joel. So Rose and Fowler off the board. They are two of uh, the players at the top, uh, but uh, they're not the favorite. Uh, they're the second choice, co-second choice. The favorite's Dustin Johnson at twelve to one. Uh, you just mentioned him before, so he's available if you want to take him. Uh, and uh, and then you've got Fowler and Rose at sixteen to one, and uh, Rory McIlroy would be next at eighteen to one. Defending champ Jordan Spieth and uh, Tommy Fleetwood at twenty to one. So uh, those are the remaining uh, players as far as the uh, favorites. Who are you going to go with? Well, it's certainly 
not an easy pick. And I mentioned Dustin Johnson ago. I do love him in this tour, man. It wouldn't surprise me to see him uh, do extremely well here. But I'm actually going to go a touchdown on that. Uh, this guy, he's won recently. But man, Brooks Kapka, he just looked – we were talking about mental fortitude a moment. He looks untouchable right now. Mm. And, and the way he's hunting at these uh, – I mean, at the last two U.S. Opens, and he's been in the top ten of this tournament the last two years. He started out in Europe, so he does have some experience with the whole links golf. Just he looks so good. I can't believe his odds are twenty-two to one with as good as he's looking right now. He can, he's going to be one of those bombers who benefits a lot from it. He's got some finesse with his uh, putting stroke. He, he can. On some of these faster greens, I think he's going to make a lot of putts, too. Yeah, Jeff, it's so obvious that the, the, the odds, what we're looking at here, is, is, is historical. It's personality. It's reputation. Whatever words you want to use, that's what it is, because there is no reason for Brooks Koepka to be 22-1 to 1 right. Brooks Koepka should probably be the damn favorite of this thing, the way he's playing. <laughs> and then you throw in Tiger Woods at 22-1. to 1. I mean, I don't care what Tiger Woods might be able to do this week. There's no way he should be the same odds as Brooks Kepka and even be anywhere near, you know, the other players that he is pretty close to as far as the odds are concerned. But he's got the name recognition. And, but, and, 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 and then Reed, you know, Patrick Reed, once again, 35 to 1. He has, he's still playing well. He won the Masters. He's, he's playing as good as anybody in the world. He's 35 to 1. So come on, realistically, if we weren't, if and I'm not saying Vegas doesn't have it right. It's just that again, that's how people will wager in golf. Personality, yeah. they identify with players who they're rooting for, and these players just haven't been around long enough uh, to garner that type of reputation yet. But realistically, I mean, Reed and Kepka could very well and maybe should be two of the top three favorites this week. Certainly, I, I would put them in the top six and. Dang, I was hoping that Joel was going to let Kepka pass one more pick because <laughs> uh, I had him down for my second pick. I, I, I think in this year, I mean, nobody thought Brooks Kepka was going to be the next guy to follow Curtis Strange, to follow Ben Hogan as back-to-back U.S. Open champions, and he handled it. And he has the European experience, as, as Joel mentioned, and he's putting extremely well and and his major uh, run right now, he, he has not finished lower than 13th but once in his last 10 major championships. And so I was, I was, I'm still all for Brooks Kepka. I just can't pick him now. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, if not for my faith in Justin Rose, Kepka might have been my top pick. All right. So uh, now our top picks are off the board. Uh, who are you going to go with as your second pick then, Jeff? All right. Well, I, I, at this point, uh, with, with Kepka off the board, I'm going to have to go uh, with, with the other Bash brother, I think. I, I, I don't think we can let Dustin Johnson go too far down uh, at this point. He has the same ability to throttle back with a three iron or a three wood, uh, and, and his accuracy is, is much better with those clubs. And uh, I think if we were to say, oh, he's the favorite and go with other guys, we'd, the possibility would definitely be there that we'd all have buyer's remorse on Sunday. So I'll take DJ. All right. And we haven't seen him since the third place, the disappointing third place finish at the U.S. Open before that, winning the FedEx St. Jude. And uh, he was runner up at the Open Championship in 2011. All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the runner-up in 07. I'm going with Sergio. Sergio seems to be trending right back uh, the way he needs to be at the right time. Uh, so uh, he's got a couple of decent finishes his last uh, two. Uh, we know how important it is to, for him to win the Open Championship. We also know we also know that if he's going to win it, he'd probably win it. He'd probably like to win it no other place than Carnoustie. Uh, he's got so many memories here, even though there have been a lot of disappointing memories at Carnoustie. But still, he loves the golf course. This is the championship that he'd love to win more than anything else. He's got 10 top 10s and 21 attempts uh, in this championship with five top fives, runner-ups, and uh, with two, two runner-ups, including the one in the playoff loss to Harrington in 07. So I'm going to take uh, Garcia at 28 to 1 as my second choice. All right, Joel, you're up next. I actually like Garcia Laws. I was wondering when he was going to go off. He's, he's definitely an interesting pick on here this week. 
I really, really want to take Henrik Stenson here. Is I mean, he's leading. He's the leader in driving accuracy, greens are regulation, and bogey avoidance. We've seen him go fifth and sixth in the majors this year. But I don't like what I'm hearing about that shoulder all of a sudden. I mean, he told he told uh, Jason Sobel, who is about as credible of a source as there is in this business, that he probably wouldn't have even made the trip if it wasn't a major. Mm, that's so, not I mean, good. Uh, just everything's lined up so well for him, but I just I can't take, take quite take that risk. So I'm gonna go with another guy who it looks like it's about his time, and he uh, has experience in this format. That's uh, Tommy Fleetwood at 20 to one. He uh, he was first in driving accuracy at Shinnecock Hill, tied for second in greens and regulation. He's um you know he had that that great finish. Well, and last year, I, I know he kind of disappointed with what his expectations were, but a lot of that, I think there was a lot of extra pressure on him being close to home. But even after that really bad first round, he bounced back pretty well. Um, I, I think he's going to be in the mix this week. Yeah, Tommy Fleetwood, I mean, he is, uh, he, boy, you know, it, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I definitely think he is a good pick. I mean, I would never try to, to, uh, uh, to uh, get you to, to or anybody. Uh, uh, to change your pick there. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned with the fact he's never finished on the par in an Open Championship. I understand it's a tough uh, a, a tough event. Uh, I, I know he got up to a slow start last year and then played well uh, the rest of the way. Uh, I, I don't like the fact that he hasn't shot in the 60s since the U.S. Open, since the 63 in the final round at the U.S. Open. So, And he hasn't necessarily had a great year, a great calendar year. So I'm a little bit concerned with all of that. And he's and his best finish was last year when he finished 27th. He missed the previous three cuts. So I'm just a little bit concerned, Jeff. Uh, there's a lot of things that concern me about Tommy Fleetwood. But, yeah, I mean, other than that, I mean, if he was just coming in with a little bit better form overall, uh, I'd probably be all over him. He might even be my first pick. Uh, I've picked him a lot, as you know, but I don't know. I'm just a little bit uh, unsure about him this week. You know he's the course record holder at Carnoustie, right? Okay. What was that, an amateur? <laughs> Dunhill Lynx. Shot oh, the Dunhill Lynx. The Dunhill Lynx. Okay. <laughs> so, Very nice. Uh, I mean, did, yeah, there, like I say, with everybody, there's a little bit of a yellow flag. Did he win that one? Just pull back. Um, I'd have to go back and look. I just remember that, that he had the 63 at, at the Dunhill Links. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe the, maybe he won't feel quite so much pressure as he did at Burkdale last year because Burkdale, you know, he grew up down the street from there. But he, he seems to have the game for a major stage. And so I, I was certainly looking at him as far as the third pick for me. Um, I, I think there's there's more positive than negative with, with Tommy Fleetwood right now. Oh, who, okay, who who would you go with, Fleetwood or Garcia? Then you would go with Fleetwood. I think I would go with Fleetwood. Um, I, and I know Garcia has a, a, a fairly good history there, but uh, uh, you know, and he's a different player than he was in '07. And and honestly, in '07, uh, he had like five or six putts that grazed the hole and refused to go in. And, you know, like I, like I say, I, I think he's more mature and he's probably would handle it better than if he was, you know, back in his 20s again. But there is a little bit of scar tissue for Sergio Garcia from 2007 at Carnoustie. Uh, by the way, uh, Fleetwood finished second in 2014, tied with Rory McIlroy uh, behind Oliver Wilson that year when he shot a 62 in the third round of the Alfred Dunhill Lynx. Okay, so uh, those are our uh, well, I, yeah, those are our top uh, two picks each. So Jeff, you've got Rose and DJ as your top two players still left on the board. The top players still left on the board. You got McElroy at eighteen to one, and you've got Jordan Spieth, defending champ, at twenty to one. Uh, you have John Rahm at twenty-two to one. That is Brady's top pick. Uh, Justin Thomas is twenty-two to one. Uh, no top fives for Justin Thomas since March, and he's a combined 14 over par in two Open Championships. Jason Day has been a quiet uh, player lately, uh, 33 to one. That's because he uh, didn't play all that well at the U.S. Open, and then uh, Tiger Woods 22 to one, uh, and then a whole bunch of other players. So, uh, have I mentioned your third pick, or is there someone else you like? Uh, maybe not in this list. But we have talked about him already uh, in, in the broadcast. And 
I was kind of hoping that he that he you know kind of crossed into that long shot territory, and he just doesn't. He's at forty five to one. Ah. But Mark Leishman has such a good open record and has the ability to handle uh, a length style golf course. Remember that that he almost won you know the the Byron Nelson on you know treeless Trinity Forest in, in Dallas, and so uh, he's just such a good match that uh, as as highly as I spoke of Patrick Reed and it came down to those two guys I, I'm going to I'm going to cast Reed aside here uh, in favor of a horse for this type of course yeah, I might actually take Leishman over Reed as well. Uh, Reed's the better player, no question. Uh, he does have two top 20s and four open championships. But Leishman, uh, y- y- if you're picking one major for Leishman to win, this is it. Uh, again, in his last four, he's sixth, second, and fifth uh, in three of the four with the runner-up pl- uh, playoff loss to Zach Johnson three years ago uh, in 2015. So, uh, Mark Leishman at forty-five to one barely did not make your long shot category, or else uh, you've been able to go. You would have went with Patrick Reed if Leishman would have been a long shot here. Yes, I think I would have. Okay, who would you go with, Joel, between Patrick Reed and Mark Leishman? I like Reed a little better. Um, I just because he's been so good in the majors this year. Uh, I mean, Leishman's obviously great in uh, in the Lynx courses, and I like them both, but he's, he hasn't looked quite the same since Aaron Wiseout dueled him at, uh, I forget what tournament that was, I'll say the Byron Nelson. Um, I like Reed a little better. I, I think okay. they're, both, they're both good, though. Plus, Reed last week, I mean, he, he, uh, he played the Scottish show, but he started off with a 65. He can play this format. All right. Uh, you know, I actually am kind of surprised. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that I get the opportunity to take this player. Uh, so I, I had my ideas on another player. But I, uh, but since this guy is still available, and there's still about a handful of guys that I, I would love to take, but I'm going to go ahead and take the hottest golfer on the planet, and that's Francisco Molinari. Uh, the guy's been amazing with two wins, two runner-ups uh, in his last five uh, there are some things, uh, and what's also keep in mind in his last three majors, he's got the runner-up at the PGA, and he's got the 25th at the U.S. Open and the 20th at the Masters. So he's been playing his best major golf. He's playing the best he's ever played in his career. Uh, there's a lot to like there about Molinari uh, as far as uh, his confidence. Now, there's a couple of things that I, I'm a little bit concerned with. Uh, one top 10 in 10 at the Open Championship. Uh, he did play here in 07. He missed a cut. Uh, but the other thing is uh, is the fact that, let's keep in mind that the run he's been on hasn't really been, I mean, the, the, he did play the U.S. Open if it's 25th, but the first, the two first and the two second weren't exactly in the best of fields. So that is the one thing. But I'm willing to accept that uh, a little bit more, Joel, because of the fact that I believe, especially in the game of golf, confidence matters so much. And I don't think Francesco Marinari looks at those two firsts, the two seconds, to finally winning on the PGA Tour as, yeah, I'm going to put an asterisk there because uh, I didn't go up against the best fields. I'm not sure that it's, 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 it's entering into Francesco Molinari's uh, equation uh, as far as his confidence right now. So there might not be a more confident player on the planet right now. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the strongest field, but he did uh, also have that second at the BMW PGA, which is always a good field. Um, he does look – he's uh, second on tour T to green right now, and that's definitely important in this kind of format. He's someone I've uh, I was looking uh, closely at. I think I have, him, I have him way too low in my rankings now that I'm looking at it right now. He should be a little higher. But he's um, – uh, he looks like he's ready for hardware uh, at his age. I, I don't like that he hasn't competed in that, hasn't been contention that often, but he has been in contention recently with that second at the PGA last year. Yeah, what he's got to do, Jeff, more than anything, uh, is he's got to have his putting going, and that's always been the thing that has uh, kind of held him back, especially in America. But, you know, he is, uh, you know, he, he is back maybe in a more comfortable environment for him, you know, back in Europe. So, but but still, you know, open championship golf, you got to have the putter going. Well, and here's my question: is that in this great run that he's had, he has not played Lynx golf, even in the two European starts. The BMW PGA is at Wentworth, a Parkland style course. The Italian Open is on a Parkland style course. He did not play the Irish or the Scottish Open because he was he played the Quicken Loans National and he played. Uh, the, the John Deere Classic. So he has not played Lynx golf in this stretch. 
and he had the flight over from Quad Cities on Sunday night to get ready. So a uh, little bit different scheduling for Francesco. Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the closest that he has played to Lynx Golf was the U.S. Open. That, exactly. That, and, uh, you know, so, so, and he did finish 25th. Okay, next up, Joel, you've got Kepka and Fleetwood as your top two picks. Well, the guy I really, really like, because this is another one where there's someone here I really, really want, but I just I don't think I'm going to be able to do it the last second. I love Tyrrell Haddon this week. Um, he's finally on again. You know how streaky he gets. And I think uh, we're going to see. I, 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 since I'm not actually going to take him here, I don't think I'm expecting him to win now. But looking at closely at the last minute, I just I can't leave Patrick Reed on the board. The way he's been playing in majors lately, he had fourth last time, and he was just killing it tee to green at um, – at uh, Shinnecock Hills, too, and he just looks, I mean, not only is he confident, he, uh, the pressure's way off him now, too, I mean, and I, I, little, I feel a little, he burnt me a little bit, I took him with the first overall pick of the Travelers, and he didn't show up that week, but that was uh, pretty, I'm going to guess that was an anomaly, he had a long streak of, uh, of top tens going on before that, and he looked good at, uh, in the Scottish show up last week, too, like I mentioned a minute ago, he started off with that 65 he just has too much going for him right now. You know, I've, I actually have had him a touch higher on my uh, rankings on Pro Golf Weekly, but I'm just, you know, last second year, push comes to shove, I can't leave Reed on the board. It's yeah, to one. and I wouldn't even worry about the Travelers. Uh, like you said, he's playing some really good golf in the big events, and he's going to be juiced up for this one, and, uh, and, and, and he'll, he'll be there. He's just playing too well. And uh, unless for some reason the course just doesn't agree with him, uh, again, he, he, he's a bargain at 35 to 1. Okay, now let's go into the long shots. These are players that are 50 to 1 or, uh, or higher. So uh, who are you going to go with, Jeff? Who's your top long shot? Uh, I, I'm going to go with, uh, with, with a veteran uh, who, who I think can handle these type of conditions a, a little bit better. Um, and, uh, and, and he was runner up last year and it was only just the, you know, the, the magnificent, you know, hour and 20 minutes of Jordan Spieth that may have kept him from having the claret jug to begin with. But Matt Kuchar, I think, uh, is a very adaptable guy who has learned how to play Lynx golf and enjoys the challenge of Lynx golf. And, uh, he's down at 80 to one. So it's kind of hard to, uh, to pass that up. All right. So going with a familiar face, uh, Matt Kuchar, eighty to one. It's a big number. Uh, it's because he hasn't had a top five since Phoenix, uh, but he uh, has uh, confidence after the runner-up last year. You would believe did play last week, even though he only played the first two days. Uh, but he is eighty to one, and uh, you know that he might even be one of these players that also at this stage of his career, if he's going to win a major, maybe Carnusti would fit his game uh, with the conditions. Uh, I'm going to be like you. I'm, I'm going to go with a familiar face, and I'm going to go with Ian Poulter uh, at sixty-six to one. Uh, I think, uh, considering how the kind of year he's having. And the fact that even though his uh, result last year in, in all, he didn't have a good uh, final round, but uh, he was there in contention in the final round last year. Uh, he was runner-up in this event in 2008. He played this event in 2007. It was 27th. Uh, but, uh, look, he's got nine top 30s in his last 10 uh, worldwide, including a win. So uh, he's on top of his game. And we've been saying this for many years, that if Ian Poulter is going to win a major, and I still believe he's going to, that uh, the Open Championship uh, would be the one. Uh, so we'll see if he could get it done at 66-1. to 1. Joel, who would you go with, Poulter or Kuchar? Uh, between those two, right now, definitely Poulter. I think he's, uh, his head's more in the... More in the game. I mean, they both are kind of desperate uh, to. They both actually both really have that biological clock ticking for this major. But um, I mean, Kuchar just looks so lost lately. I just I just don't trust him right now. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see him um, have run last year. Like he he looked real confident last year. You know, he wants one of these. But between those two, I just I think I like more what I'm seeing from Poulter um, right now. Who are you going to go with with your long shot? Uh, Louis Louis. 80 to 1. I like really like those odds on him. A little concerned about that. So I'm not really sure why he pulled out. I heard it was a neck injury, but I've heard nothing since then. So I'm going to I'm 
going to gamble that it's just um, it was mostly precautionary. But he's been playing well lately, and you know he shows up for the majors. He's got uh, a win and a, a T2 and this and that. He's finished at least second in all four majors now. Um, he has looked good lately. He had embarrassingly few birdies at Shinnecock Hills, like five for the entire week. But he, aside from that, I mean, but he still ended up finishing inside the top 20 there. He's you know, avoiding the bogeys pretty well. And his overall game, I, I think he's ready for another one of these. All right. Well, you've uh, taken Ustazen uh, more than we have lately, so you believe in him. We'll see at 80-1 to 1, uh, if uh, he's a bargain or not. Now we go to the alternates. And, Jeff, you have Justin Rose, uh, Dustin Johnson, and Mark Leishman. So you're alternate, and uh, you get to choose from the remaining players under 50-1. to 1. It's Rory McIlroy, Jordan Spieth, John Rahm, Justin Thomas, Henrik Stenson, Jason Day, Tiger Woods, uh, Alex Norin and Paul Casey, Terrell Hatton, uh, and Brendan Grace. I think that's it, right? I think that's everybody under fifty to that's one. Enough. Yeah, that's enough, <laughs> no question. And and not just enough players, but enough good players. So uh, <laughs> you've got you got enough choices. Who are you going to go with? I'm going to go with a guy that has had a really solid season. Has has almost uh, won on the PGA Tour. Um, and I think it's just, you know, kind of taken that next step here in the last couple of years. Uh, I'm not sure how he's going to do with Lynx Golf, but he's an alternate pick. I'll give him a go. Alex Norin at 30 to 1. Yeah, Norin uh, was, was one of my three remaining players here. Uh, and uh, so you made it easy for me. Uh, but Norin, with the sixth last year, which was his best major result ever. And so he's got that confidence, finally, of performing well at the Open Championship. Uh, he's coming off the win in his last event a few weeks ago in France. And like you said, uh, he has come close recently to winning on the PGA Tour, too. So Norin, uh, not a bad way to go at 30-1. to 1. All right, uh, my two now are going to come down to two players. going to come down to a couple of 40-1 to 1 shots. Now, I don't have to ask you who you like, Joel. Because you've already mentioned the one name, and that's Terrell Hatton. The other player is Paul Casey. So, Jeff, what do you think about Paul Casey versus Terrell Hatton at 40 to 1? Uh, I'm leaning towards Casey. You know, Casey's been the better player pretty much uh, because of his, his being able to do it on the PGA Tour. He's trending well coming in here. Uh, his best finish ever in a major was in this event in 2010. He finished third, even though he has been pretty disappointing overall in majors over his career, whereas Terrell Hatton is also playing some pretty good golf. He's also a very good putter. Uh, only made one of five cuts here, though, uh, uh, in his, his career, one of six cuts here in his career. That was a fifth a couple of years ago. That concerns me. He hasn't played well in majors, but he has won the Alfred Dunhill Links twice. So uh, and I don't know if one of them was at Carnoustie, but anyway. Well, it, it, that's a rotating uh, situation where it's Carnoustie and St Andrews and Joel. Help me out. What's the other? What, what's the third course on that list? Is that Troon? I'm sorry, Carnoustie. And what, I'm sorry, what was the other one? Carnoustie, St Andrews, and what's the, what's the other course on uh, the uh, on the Dunhill Links Rota? Oh, I knew this. It's one on each course, and so you you get Carnoustie once every time. <laughs> so is it every three years then? No, it, it's it, it, it's like it, it, it's like Pebble Beach. You play one one round of Pebble oh, Beach, one round of Poppy Hills, and one round at Monterey Peninsula. Got it. Now Same I understand. Okay, so it is. So then, and, and what do they rotate the final round? And the final round is always on the old course at St Andrews. Oh, the St Andrews gets the final round. Got it. Okay. Uh, so anyway, who, who would you go with, Casey or Hatton, Jeff? I, I just I, I think not only does Hatton have the, the the couple of trophies from Dunhill Links, but he's also on this run here from from the U.S. Open to the French Open to the Scottish Open six sixteen and nine. And as as much as I like Paul Casey, I think Hatton really has caught a spark here. Mm. And you definitely would go with Hatton, Joel. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm already uh, I'm already having some buyer's remorse on Patrick Reed, and that's even with him having unbelievable odds. I just like Hatton that much. 
All right. Well, I'll, 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 you know what? I'll throw you a bone then, Joel, since it's so tough for me to decide. I'll take Paul Casey at 40 to 1 uh, because you are going to take Hatton, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I was thinking Tiger, but now I got to take him. No, I was going to go with Hatton, definitely. <laughs> Tiger. All right, so uh, we'll uh, we'll go Casey and Hatton there at forty to one uh, as our alternates. Uh, all right, well, you know what? Uh, before we get into the alternate long shots, uh, what do you think about uh, the uh, the big guys, uh, Tiger Woods at twenty two to one, and Phil Mickelson's a long shot, uh, Jeff. I'm not sure if he's on your mind, but he's sixty six to one. Not sure Tiger Woods should be three times the shorter price than Phil Mickelson. I'm not, I don't know what that's about. I know Phil isn't exactly playing his best golf, but, I mean, until last week he was making cuts. Uh, but Phil hasn't exactly been all that great in majors lately. But still, I mean, he did win. He has played well in the Open Championship recently compared to Tiger, who hasn't played here in, what, two or three years. So uh, in his last three Open Championships, Tiger Woods is a combined 15 over par. Uh, based on the odds alone, if I'm just picking the two, I'd take Mickelson at 66 to one and Tiger at 22 to one. Uh, I, I'm with you there. I, I just, uh, I, I just think that we ha- we have some sort of baseline for what Phil has done, and as long as he doesn't come up with some sort of weird rule to break <laughs> uh, over the course of the weekend, uh, I, I still think he's. We know what we're going to get out of him, and, and Tiger. Yeah, everybody's been hearing and reading all of it. On, and last time we had these kind of conditions, Tiger didn't hit but one driver, and he won at Hoylake. Yes, but it was 12 years ago, and that was before the knee surgeries and the back surgeries. And you know, as well as, as he has come back, he's not that guy. And I, I think there's just a lot of wishful and, and hopeful thinking there. Not to say that he can't necessarily do it. I don't think we can rule that out at this point anymore. Sure. But I know what I'm getting with Phil Mickelson, and, and so I think he's the safer bet between the two. And you would go with Tiger, based even based on those odds, Joel? Um, based on those, uh, well, the odds make it a little different. On, on, my, uh, on my rankings, actually, I have Tiger 12th and Phil 18th. Um, you look at those rankings, I, I, Phil does seem to like this tournament a lot more than, than he used to. And I just, I mean, Tiger, his, his putter hasn't really been all there lately, but he's clicking with his irons. He's been really strong around the greens. I think uh, hopefully the, the conditions will um, make it a little um, better with his driver. Or wait, or I don't know if he'll take driver out, but with you know, his tee shots anyway. Um, Mickelson, I'm seeing 66 to 1. Is that. Yeah. Guess, okay. For some reason, I thought he was lower than that. No. Three yeah. times. Oh, yeah. Is, uh, three. yeah, those odds, yeah, I'm taking Mickelson over Woods. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty close, even if I have six spots uh, separating. If them. Tiger, just, there are it, just so many good players. I mean, if Tiger was 40 to 1, which is where I think he should be, uh, I'd be like, okay, you know what? I'd, I'd invest a couple of bucks in Tiger. You never know. I mean, why not? Uh, just for the hell of it. But 22 to 1, I mean, yeah, I'll pass. Uh, that's it's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. If he wins, great. Uh, that'd be great for the sport. But just uh, the odds are just nuts. All right, Jeff, uh, your alternate long shot. You've got Kucher as your top boy, so uh, you've got a whole list of long shots to choose from. Yeah, yeah, I- including Phil Mickelson. And, and I gave Mickelson a little bit of thought here, but I'm going to reach a little bit further down for, for a guy that's really kind of had a resurgent year this year, and, uh, you know, played pretty decent two weeks ago at the Irish Open, so has been on links of late. I'm going to go with Thunder Bear, Torby Orn Olison. Yeah, Olison was uh, definitely in my long shots. Uh, there were four that I had remaining. He wasn't my top choice, but he might have been second, possible. Uh, yeah, he, he, he's, uh, again, we've talked a lot about his inconsistencies and based on the way he's gone his last five events, uh, he'll miss the cut this week. Uh, uh, but the other yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, in his other uh, three, he's sixth, second, and first. And he did win the uh, Alfred Dunhill Lynx in 2015. We talked about that. He's 100 to 1. So uh, maybe this is the perfect time for uh, Thorborg Olason to go out there and surprise some people. Uh, and get a win. So, yes, uh, I, I agree with that pick. Uh, but you know what? I'm going to go ahead, since you went that way, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna go back. I mentioned this at the open of the show. Uh, going with uh, players that uh, may you would not normally think about. Look, you took Justin Rose. He doesn't have a great history at this golf uh, at this event. Yet he was your first overall pick. So I'm gonna take a player that does not have a good history here, uh, but is having a tremendous year. And 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 he's eighty to one. So why not? He's my second alternate. I'll go with Bubba Watson uh, as my alternate. I know he doesn't have any top tens in this event, but with the way that the course is laid out, he's got the power game. Uh, maybe that. And this is an unusual situation with the Open Championship, with the weather, with this specific golf course. Maybe that works into uh, Bubba Watson's uh, favor. Uh, because the course is not uh, laid out the way it normally is. So uh, if it was, maybe Bubba would have a bad week. But since it's not, maybe he'll have a good week. And he's just playing such good golf, maybe the power in his game, uh, if it does become an advantage uh, for other power hitters uh, that you've already taken a couple there, Jeff, uh, yourself. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe it'll work out for Bubba. All right. Uh, which way would you go, uh, Olison or Watson, Joel? Between those two, uh, Olson, I mean Watson. There, he's the only man in the world who can say that he's got three. Or in the professional tours, that says he can has he's got three wins this year. So it's a little tempting in in that regard. But I mean, Olson's had some really good outings. At three, I think three top sixes in his last uh, four or five events. He's um, I, he looks like someone who uh, is going to contend in a major soon. I feel a little more comfortable with him than Watson right now. But I don't mean. I, I can't blame anyone for taking a three-time winner this season at 80-to-1 odds. All right. That's pretty much what I'm doing. <laughs> well, go ahead, yeah. uh, Joel. Uh, who is your alternate long shot pick? Well, this one might be important. I, I, I had to his in last week, too, and he did withdraw. It was my first withdrawal of the year. Um, neither of these are going to come as a surprise. There's two guys that I'm deciding between right here, and they're both players I take frequently on this show. But, I mean, there's a guy at 100 to 1 odds who's got two top tens in majors this year. That's Tony Finau. He, um, yeah, he got that. Maybe he was aided a little bit by that third round situation, but still, I mean, he he still played well there. He hung in uh, till the end. He's a long hitter. I, the conditions here are, may help him out quite a bit. Uh, he's playing a lot of good events lately. I really tempted Xander Shoffley. He should not be 150 to one. I don't get so, how someone with his history in the big events lately is 150 to one. But um, just between those two, I'm going to go a little bit with the length and better recent form. I mean, Shoffley, he's been showing up in the big events. Uh, the Greenbrier, he was great through three rounds. He had five bogeys in a row at one point in the last round. So really, it was just that that kind of threw him off. And I mean, that happens to everyone, but. Um, I, I've seen all this rate a touch higher. I think at 100 to 1 odds for a guy with two top 10s in majors this year is a pretty good deal. All right. Well, uh, with, with all our picks in, uh, actually only a couple of players that were left on the board uh, that I was looking at, uh, and that uh, that I still have, and they're both long shots. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to put uh, a, a couple of bucks on, uh, on, on Lee Westwood and Brant Snedeker. Uh, I did Snedeker at the U.S. Open, and uh, it didn't work out completely, of course, but he's coming off a third-place finish, and, uh, you know, he's one of these veteran players that has uh, had his moments in Open Championship play before, and uh, maybe with the weather conditions, uh, maybe it will work for a shorter hitter. Uh, but Lee Westwood, uh, I think, could be interesting, Jeff. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's actually playing okay lately considering where he was before the last say five or six events where he just wasn't playing well at all uh so maybe it's not a coincidence he's starting to now kind of play better maybe he's eyeing the fact that he understands that you know and, and look if tom watson can almost win the open championship at 59 uh, i don't think lee westwood's done with the opportunity to win an open championship either uh and maybe with the conditions the way they are maybe lee could have a good week this week very possibly so. One, one thing that we need to remember, too, is that the Open Championship, because of having to play a different style of golf and, and to deal more with weather conditions than the other majors, although this could be uh, a, a benign year compared to those, but eight of the past 11 champions 
won the Open at age 35 or older. Hmm. So some some of the some of the savvy grizzled uh, I've been here before uh, factor comes in at this major more than any other. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So uh, anybody else that you were that were that, that were in your picks in the running, Jeff? I, I I know that his putting has has not been very good, but I gave Rory McIlroy some consideration this week. I I think there's a possibility that you know being uh, on a on, on a Lynx course where the weather is really good uh, that that he could all of a sudden click in. So that was. That was somebody that I definitely looked at. I, I think Zach Johnson has that veteran savvy to, to possibly uh, get a, a second claret jug, although a lot of people say, oh, those that say that the, that the baked out fairways will benefit the short hitters, I'm not so sure because Zach Johnson still has to hit driver to keep up with everybody else. Uh, so I'm not sure that that's uh, necessarily the situation. Uh, I'm kind of curious what would, what's going to happen with Ryan Fox. Uh, remember, Ryan Fox lost that playoff at the Irish Open to Russell Knox a couple weeks ago, and he is if he is not the longest driver on the European Tour, he is very, very close to it, and he gets it out there. Uh, they, they were saying 370 at the Irish Open, and now you get to Carnoustie where they've had two more weeks of, of dry weather, what might he be able to do if he can drive it that far and be accurate with it? Yeah. Well, he might be, who knows, he, he could be putting for several eagles on some par fours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Fox, by the way, followed up that. If you don't hit it in the burn. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the gamble. Uh, Fox uh, followed up that, uh, that runner-up with the sixth last week. So he's on top of his game. Uh, I, I was kind of thinking Zach Johnson as well. He's got six top 20s in his last seven Open Championships, including the win. Uh, the only thing that, that prevented me from going away from Zach was just, I don't know, I mean, three majors for Zach and two Open Championships? Wow, that's, that's quite an accomplishment, and especially with all these good players he's going up against. That was just too many. The odds were just too much for me to go that direction, but I was thinking about him. Uh, I was also thinking a little bit about Rafa Cabrera Bayo fourth last year, but and he won the Scottish Open last year, but he comes in with three missed cuts in a row, so that uh, that, that that wasn't good. And uh, I was thinking about another long shot that we might hear of that the PGA Tour followers Joel don't know about, and that's uh, Matthew Southgate. You know, he's uh, got uh, sixth and a twelfth his last two years uh, yeah, at the Open Championship. Yeah, he's playing well in this tournament. Um, his uh, results uh, this year have just been kind of so-so, but he uh, held his own the past uh, the past few years. He uh, he was I want to say he was fifth at the French Open. He's got a few decent uh, decent starts. Um, it, he's uh, it could be someone we're going to hear more about. He seems to like this event. And uh, what about you? Anybody else? Yeah, I thought there uh, there was a really good chance I was going to end up with Brandon Grace this week. I'm surprised that nobody took him. He's got, um, I mean, he's got that low ball flight. He's had some really good scores here. He's had a five top sixes in majors over the last four seasons. He's another one that looks pretty close uh, to having that major, although just two top tens on the PGA this season. But yeah. those are coming up better lately. And uh, another one, um, I didn't have him in my top 30 rankings, but I'm kind of warming up to him the more I'm reading on him. Um, do you know who the leader in greens and regulation was at Shinnecock Hills? How Tong Lee. I mean, he, and he finished third at this thing last year. He um, has had some – he won that Omega Dubai Desert Classic earlier this week, which is a good field for this event. I was just concerned about whether he can put four uh, good rounds together. And he, he's kind of young. You kind of want a little more veteran presence at this kind of thing. But yeah, that's that's the ticket right there. Is only the third place was that's it. He, he hasn't. He's got nothing else to show for it in Open Championship play. Yeah. And you would think that, especially at Carnoustie, uh, he's going to need a little bit more experience. So, uh, by the way, uh, how about Alexander Bjork? He's playing some pretty good golf. Five top twenties in his last eight. Three top tens. Two top fives and a win. And he there is sitting there good. at uh, what? He's got a big number, right? Two fifty to one. 
There's yeah. some good. There's some good ones down there. Um, Pierre Uline's 251. If the driver doesn't matter, he he grew up. Uh, he started his PGA Tour career. I mean, he started golf, made a professional golf career in Europe. So he's someone that could be comfortable here. And they got Bo Hosler on there. I, Patrick Cantley and Bo Hosler are both in that category where I, I think they have the game for it, especially Cantley. But it's just so hard to pick a player who has not actually played a U, uh, no oh, yeah. championship before. But, I mean, even though there have been a, a few guys that have come in, I mean, not just Ben Curtis. I mean, talk about Lee last year. Uh, you know, Shoffley played well last year as a first-timer. But I think Cantley is interesting at 100-to-1 odds, even not having played this before. I just It's just so hard to pull the trigger in, in that kind of situation. All right. Also, uh, let's see, uh, another player we haven't mentioned, Webb Simpson. You know, he, he plays pretty well. In open championships, he's made a lot of cuts. <clears throat> and uh, also, uh, you know, maybe Thomas Peters is somebody to look out for. Jeff, I know, uh, you know, there was a time that you were on a run of Thomas Peters' picks. Of course, he's cooled off a little bit, but he was sixth last week, and he's got the power game. He does have the power game. And, and the question that I had to ask myself when I looked at him was, does he have the accuracy game to go with the power game? And, and is he that? Is he the type of cerebral player that would that that would pick the right moments to take the foot off the pedal a little bit and use the three wooden three iron and uh, we also nobody uh, went with russell knox as hot as russell knox is uh was that because of his 75 on sunday you know is that, think- is that a cool off uh, signal I think that I think that uh, part of it is, is that he's he's had a, a pretty good run and and maybe it is a cool off signal. Here's the other part of it. Do you realize? I'll I'll, I'll throw it throw it out this way. How many Scottish golfers are in this Open Championship field this year? Two. Five. Okay. It, it, it's a small number still, and he's the he's the highest ranked of the bunch. So. Uh, the last time a Scottish player won the Open Championship was at Carnoustie back in 1999 when uh, Paul Laurie came from 10 shots off the pace and, uh, you know, and needed John Vandeveld's follies at, at 18. But I think that if he gets up in there toward the weekend with carrying all the hopes of, of that nation, that might be a little tough. Yeah, it, it, it's something to post early, uh, like uh, um, like we saw in '99, but a little yeah, bit different Laurie, yeah. <laughs> than uh, going out there because we're not gonna again unless the conditions go crazy on Sunday, which is not supposed to. Uh, chances are you're not going to be able to post that early uh, and and see a whole lot of uh, players uh, with major big scores coming in. Even though again that that 18th hole uh, is still very dangerous. And uh, you shouldn't feel comfortable with a two-stroke lead uh, on 18 if you've got the if you do have the lead. A uh, couple more things, Adam Scott. Uh, by the way, Joel, I don't know if you know this, but Adam Scott's still playing golf. That's what I'm hearing. Um, he, I, I, for, I forgot he even made the field for a moment. I thought <laughs> I remember he got he had he went through qualifying and, and he got in. Yeah. But I um, mean, he likes this style of play. He does. He's, uh, one of among non-Europeans, he's one of the best Lynx players out there. So, I mean, he's worth at least considering at, at those kind of odds. It just the just form just hasn't been there for me to take a serious look at him. But those are pretty good, uh, high odds for how well he plays in Lynx courses. Yeah, not uh, he hasn't won since 2016. We'll see if his putting game, because uh, it's only been a, a, a what one or two events, Jeff, where he's changed his putting style. Yeah, but he is going or has gone back to what he had the most success with. Now he's had to make the the proper adjustments so as not to anchor. But I think there is a confidence factor, kind of from the get go, because that's that's when he had most of his biggest wins. Yeah, was sure. Using I'd that stick putter, definitely. And maybe the the past month off, maybe uh, you got to believe that's that's what he's doing an awful lot of is uh, getting that down. So who knows? You know, who knows if Adam Scott's going to come out there and have a good week putting? Because if he does, based on his history at the Open Championship, he could be interesting at 125 to 1. 
Uh, d- did you see the uh, the, the, the Carnoustie special on Golf Channel, Joel? I did not. You didn't? Okay. No. Uh, you did, Jeff, then, right? The, the Vandeveld yeah. uh, referees? Yes. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I was, I mean, I know they've done that like 10 times, but uh, I guess they were trying something different. I really don't know what they were thinking about, though, uh, with the whole, uh, you know, with the whole uh, dude in the bar thing. You know, I'm with you on that. that, I, I, that was they painful. must have been trying to grab a younger audience or something to, to try and make a thread of it, but if they'd just produ- uh, presented it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, as more of a straight documentary. Yeah. I mean, the documentary stuff was that outstanding. That was good. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the the thread that they tried to draw through it, I didn't get it either. Yeah. So you know, who knows? Maybe they did it and they said, "Wait a second, we got 15 minutes of time left. We got to come up with something. <laughs> so let's 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 throw this together uh, and uh, see if that works." Uh, well, it didn't. Okay. So anyway. Uh, Joel, appreciate it. We'll see you on Friday and Saturday when we have our Open Championship coverage continuing with a Round 3 preview on Friday at 6 Eastern, Round 4 final round preview Saturday at 6 Eastern. So unless uh, we get any crazy delays or, 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 or we're just not thinking about the time properly, hopefully we'll get the odds out on time. That's why we're thinking 6 Eastern should work fine. We should... We should get the uh, odds uh, no problem, and we'll be able to go over uh, how things have gone over the first two days on uh, on Friday to, uh, to start off with uh, with that. So uh, enjoy the golf. Uh, you're gonna stay up late, or you're gonna DVR the thing. Uh, I'll probably stay up late. At, I'm better at that time of day. Oh, okay. Is that because of the kids? Um, not really. It's just how I always. My, my, this is how my clocks always kind of work. Okay, sounds good. So enjoy live golf at 4 in the morning. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. And we'll talk to you on Friday. Great, thank you. Thanks, Joel. All right. And, Jeff, what are you going to do? DVR I'm or actually, stay up late? I, I'm, I'm going the other way. I, I'm, I'm actually, I'll probably miss the one thirty to 4 o'clock time frame and, unless there's something absolutely compelling in those first two rounds. But then I'll I'll get up at four and and you know do the twelve hours from there. Okay. Well, do do, do we know? Well, I know we do know. But uh, what, what what are there any interesting tea times that you're aware of? Uh, we, By the way, we didn't talk uh, about and trust me, we weren't going to anyway. But there is the Barbasol this week. <laughs> so, uh, which which the but only thing good is, about it is is that at least there's you know you can watch golf when the Open Championship's over when the round's over. If you want to. Well, there, there's that and the fact that we have Brittany Lincecum uh, teeing off with the guys. And with her power game, she's going to be able to keep up with, 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 a lot of the, uh, with a lot of the players on the PGA Tour in that category. And remember that the top 80 or so golfers in the world are at Carnoustie. So she's also playing a very watered-down field. This might be you know, a perfect storm, so to speak, where we actually see the first woman make a PGA Tour cut since Babe Zaharias in 1945 in L.A. I would like that. That would definitely boost the TV ratings uh, as far as the weekend is concerned at the Barbasol. Billy Horschel's the favorite, I think, right? I think think you're right. Uh, He and James Hahn are the top two players uh, in the world rankings that are that are in the field, uh, All right. Billy Horschel, Chris Kirk, and Brian Gay are the guys that are atop the odds. Yeah, I got Billy Horschel has got to be very upset that he's not at the Open Championship. So you would you would have to think that, and and, and in a certain sense, I'm surprised that he's committed to play in Kentucky, just knowing what follows. You know, there's going to be the Canadian Open. I guess he's going to take Canada off, perhaps, but then World Golf Championship. Uh, Wyndham, and then the playoffs start. So we, we go into, this is the start of that heavy schedule. Well, when's the where, PGA? Or, I'm sorry, the PGA, yeah. Canadian World Golf Championships PGA. So PGA is three weeks from this week. That How is, do I leave the PGA boy, out? That's... Maybe I've already got them in May mentally. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Thank goodness for next year. Thank goodness they are finally changing that schedule. Uh, that's going to be much better next year. Uh, but also, that's, uh, this, is, this is it. This is the beginning of the run. Uh, it uh, is. This is great. you got the Open Championship. Okay, you know, Canada at least is a normal downfield. 
So it's 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 workable. You know, it's viewable. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll say this too: that I, I am so happy that the Canadian Open is moving out of that slot next year. They they I think they have the worst slot on the PGA Tour schedule because they are wedged in between two majors and a World Golf Championships event in a four-week stretch there. And uh, so many of the big names with the travel and everything else were you know, just automatically scratched it from their schedule. It's the third oldest Open yeah. in golf yeah. and it deserved a lot better. And so now that they're going to take that and move it to the week before the U.S. Open, I think is a wonderful move uh, by the PGA Tour. I've been advocating it for like five years now. I'm glad Good. it happened. And, uh, yeah, uh, and, and by the way, and, and they don't set on a specific course, do they? They usually change every few years or something like that? It's been one of those things where for a while they, they kept it uh, out in uh, Oakville, Ontario, out at um, uh, what, the, 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 the course name. It's a, it's a Jack Nicholas course. Um, uh, name just escaped me here. They kept it out there for a number of years, and they started rotating it, and then they – they brought it back, kind of under you know, underneath the uh, back back to that uh, that that same course at. Uh, I'll get it here in a second. I think. Um, and do you know if they're uh, Glen Abbey? Glen Abbey. And are they staying uh, but, there? Is that uh, the idea? For for the short term, and and it's an interesting thing going on with Glen Abbey. Glen Abbey is actually the home of Golf Canada, which is you know their USGA, and so. I think I think part of the reason it, that it's been there so many times is because it is you know right next door to, to the Golf Canada's headquarters. But there's also something going on with with the, whoever owns the land, and I guess Golf Canada doesn't own all the land. But Glen Abbey is kind of in limbo because uh, there is a proposal to turn to turn Glen Abbey of all places in into some housing developments. And so I think they want to hold it at Glen Abbey right now as often as they can to maybe head that off at the path. All right. Well, Hey, either way, uh, it's good that they're, they're going to get a better field and, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, more recognition too. Uh, you, you don't want to be after the major. It, it's not no. easy before or after, but it's much better before. So. And and with in this case, you have the travel factor. Not only do you get all the guys fatigued from playing four days of Lynx golf, six if you count the practice rounds, then they got to get on a plane and come back across the Atlantic and then be asked to tee off, uh, you know, three days later in a competitive situation. Uh, no matter who's in that slot, uh, it was it was going to be a very uh, a very unfortunate situation. And uh, I don't know, you know, why Canada drew the short straw for ten years, but that's where they have been, and you know they've soldiered through, and they've got a great sponsor now. RBC not only sponsors the Canadian Open, but the Heritage out at Harbor Town. So I think that was part of it too. Is RBC stepped up and said, you know what, we're sponsoring two of these things. Help us out here. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. All right. Uh, by the way, taking a look at uh, the top notable names real early, and tea time starts at one thirty-five. And by the way, coverage starts at one thirty, so they are going to show every. Uh, well, they could show basically if they wanted to uh, every ball that's hit at the Open Championship on Thursday and Friday. So uh, that's kind of cool. I mean, look. In all honesty, all honesty, because of the fact that it takes a while for you to get all these players, at least the first two or three groups out, uh, things will be a little slow with the first group or two. Uh, but uh, you know, at least by like the fourth group, you know, two a.m. to two twenty a.m. with the fifth group, then 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 you know, then there's constant uh, look around and see. Not that you know, even though there's not a lot of big names early. You got Martin Keimer, Andy Sullivan, Danny Willett. Uh, the Grio Will It List uh, group is out there at 2 a.m. Uh, and then you have to really go down to probably Terrell Hatton at 2.40 a.m. with Cantley and Lowry. Uh, we, and, and, and then Mickelson's at 3 a.m. Uh, the best group, uh, the really the, the top group early on, well, the earliest top group, I should say, uh, we'd have to go down to 5 a.m. And that's Spieth and Rose with Abby Bonrot. So 
so one of the premier type of groups uh, won't really go to 5 a.m. Speed throws and I'll be Bonrot, followed by Rom Fowler and Chris Wood, followed by Ustays and Casey and Reed. So the so the 5 a.m., the 5:10 a.m., and the 5:20 a.m. Eastern time uh, groups. Those are that's the best time if you if you're thinking about so so I know you were saying 4 a.m. You know that that's not a bad time to get up because you're still kind of groggy and uh, you know by 5 a.m. when the really good groups start coming out you'll be uh, kind of into it. The uh, coffee has kicked in by then. Yes, because uh, I usually get up about five uh, between five and 5:30 a.m. myself. Uh, nowadays, so it'll be automatic for me, uh, and then later on uh, in the day, the, the the you know as far it, you probably got to go down to Tiger and Matsuyama with Russell Knox as the best latest group, and that's two twenty a.m. So, uh, and by the way, do you think that uh, because of the way the weather is supposed to be, that we're not we shouldn't see any differences between the early groups and the late groups? It's all a question of wind in that case. So the wind could still um, be a factor in this tournament, even though we're not going to get a whole bunch of crazy weather. Precisely. Uh, I, I mean, Lynx golf is, is really based on wind uh, and not, you know, if you get rain, you get rain. But, but wind is, is the real determining factor, and, and uh, we can get that whether it's dry or wet. All right. Uh, before we go, I'm going to ask you uh, for your top three picks overall. This is without our our own picks game contest. So this way, uh, who who are your top three picks coming in uh, to the show? Uh, Joel's top three picks, and he still was able to hold on to his top pick, was Brooks Kepka. So his second pick was your second pick on the show, Dustin Johnson. And his third pick was my first pick, Ricky Fowler. So Joel's top three is going to be Kepka, Dustin Johnson, and Ricky Fowler. Uh, and then, of course, uh, for the game, uh, it's Kepka, Fleetwood, and Reed. Uh, my top three for the game is Fowler, Garcia, Molinari. My top three overall, Rose, Fowler, Garcia. So I still got two out of my three. You took my top one. So uh, Rose is obviously your top pick, too. So we both have the same uh, top pick. We're both going with Justin Rose uh, as the top pick. Who would be your second and third choice? Well, I think you, you know, if, you, if you rewind 40 minutes or whatever, you heard me say that you know, I was hoping that Kepka would fall far enough for me to grab him with the second pick because those were my top two, Rose and Kepka. And then uh, I think Dustin Johnson uh, would have been – or well, he's my second pick anyway, uh, but uh, he falls into that number three slot. Okay, of anybody. And Brady Cannon, uh, his top pick was uh, John Rom. None of us took Rom, but Brady did. And uh, his uh, official long shot was uh, of a hundred to one or more was uh, Karadek Abi Bonrat at a hundred to one. Uh, we only have two players that we took that were hundred to one or more: Joel Tony Finau and Jeff going with uh, Olasan. Uh, at 100 to 1. All right, so we'll be back again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, on Friday and Saturday. So it uh, should be a lot of fun. We'll see how uh, things go over the first two days as far as the weather, the course, all of that, uh, all the storylines. It should be a lot of fun. Really looking forward to it. As we said at the very opening of the show, thank goodness the Open Championship is here. Uh, I, and, and by the way, Jeff, one thing I, I hope we do avoid, I don't, think it's, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but I do not like the trend that we have been seeing lately of uh, not only have we had bad fields uh, over the last whatever month or so, but we sure have seemed to have a lot of runaways, too. I don't know if you noticed that. It's like I haven't, I haven't, I don't, have, we, have you remembered a stretch where we've had more, more events like over by time? the final round started like in like a month or two period. Well, we, we have, we have had this three week stretch where the combined margin of victory for, for the last three events has been 21 strokes, eight, five and eight. Really? What also strikes me is remember when we were going through that stretch in January and February and even into early March (laughs) where we had playoffs 
<laughs> just about every week. So the, the <laughs> pendulum has gone completely the other way. Now. Yeah, good point. So we'll see how it goes uh, as we get to the stretch drive for 2018, starting with the Open Championship, PGA coming soon, another WGC, the FedEx playoffs, and the Ryder Cup. So looking forward to it. We'll see you on Friday, everybody. Thanks to Joel Cook, Brady Cannon, Jeff Shane. I'm Greg DePama. Also thanks out, of course, to Covers and Pro Golf Weekly. Uh, we'll see you Friday, everybody.